We are online. <clears throat> Dina. Good morning, everyone. I hope you are safe these days. My name is Dina Yakoleva. I'm Senior Analyst of Natural Gas Markets at Refinitiv. And today we welcome you to Refinitiv Joint Webinar in partnership with ISIS, Macroeconomic Drivers of Chemical Markets, a focus on recovery. And before we start, we have some housekeeping rules. Whether you have any technical questions, please refer to the instructions that you received at the welcome email or to our Q&A box session. Also, you can uh, ask our speakers some questions that, that you are interested in. We will refer them after the webinar in their emails uh, together with webinar materials. So before we start, uh, if you can hear me well and you are in a good mood and everything is okay, please put a sign, plus sign to our Q&A box, waiting for your pluses. Can you hear me? Everything is okay. You are in the mood of chemical markets to hear. Okay, so let us begin. And uh, the global economic crisis that is happening today has affected all industrial sectors and other chemical as well. As of today, these days, we have the following picture. Supply exceeds the demand. European storages are overfilled, yeah. Producers around the world are forced to cut capacity load. And better chemical markets are under high pressure. So today we will discuss the state chemical markets meta crisis and what is foreseen for the nearest future. And I'm giving the world to my colleague Anna Shapovalova. She will claim a bit on a Russian methanol market and what is expected. Anna, good morning. Uh, hello, Dina. Hello, Dina. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you are staying safe and healthy. <laughs> I will talk about key indicators of the Russian market, uh, capacities, uh, production volumes, consumption, and show forecasts for the next few years. Uh, methanol is a highly interesting commodity uh, as being as alternative feedstock to oil and LPG for the synthesis of mostly all petrochemical products. Uh, methanol production process consists of uh, two stages, synthesis gas production and its uh, processing to methanol. Uh, feedstock value for the synthesis uh, gas production is a major part of methanol production cost. Thus, an access to cheap feedstock is a key success factor. Uh, today, natural gas is the most uh, suitable feedstock in terms of cost and uh, complexity of a production process. In this regard, uh, countries which possess low price natural gas uh, have increased national production capacity recently. The only exception is China. Uh, being driven by government policy, a chemical industry in China is focused on low cost coal feedstock. Uh, this also contributes to security of energy supply. Uh, grand total of uh, global methanol production capacity to 2020 is uh, nearly 146 million tons per annum. Uh, over the 10-year uh, period, uh, the production doubled, mainly due to capacity increase in China. Uh, despite of uh, modernization process and new units launch in Russia, its share plunged in 2020 compared to 2010 from 5 to 3 percent. In addition to China, the top methanol production countries are New Zealand, the United States, Trinidad and Tobago, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Chile and Russia. As I mentioned already, almost all of producers except China uh, use natural gas feedstock. 
Top three producing companies are Metanex, uh, Methanol Holdings Trinidad Limited, and Sabic. Uh, on the capacity structure chart on the left, uh, on the capacity structure chart on the left, Russia and CIS share do not include recently launched Turkmen gas to gasoline complex. Its capacity stays nearly 2 million ton per annum with natural gas as feedstock. I didn't account for this one as uh, methanol produced there used for processing into synthetic gasoline. On the chart, uh, you can see uh, capacity dynamics of Russian producers. Uh, presented data do not include small-scale pilot production units placed at uh, gas condensate fields. Over the past uh, 15 years, a part of current facilities were under a modernization process and several new ones were launched. I would like to draw your attention to some of them. In uh, 2006, Tomet commissioned a new production unit by Methanol Kazali Technology. Its capacity 550 kiloton per annum. Thus, total Tomet uh, capacity rose up to 1 million ton annually. In 2011, uh, Shokin Azot launched a new production facility unit for 450 kiloton per annum by Halder Topsy Technology with subsequent closure of outdated ones. Then in 2018, another technology of uh, the same uh, company, uh, Halder Topsy, was applied to the second facility as a combined uh, methanol and ammonia production complex with a capacity of 400. 50 kiloton per year. It is uh, what is saying that the combined production scheme uh, for products linked to the same resource base is, is very prospective. In case of changing market conditions, uh, producers have visibility to vary production volumes uh, with no loss in capacity utilization. In 2022, Shokina Azot plans to launch the third unit for 550 kiloton uh, per annum by Halder Topsic technology as well. If uh, commissioned su successfully, uh, Shokina Azot may become the major methanol producer in Russia with a total annual capacity of 1,400 kiloton. I also need to say about another completed project for the combined production of methanol and ammonia. Uh, this project was executed in uh, 2015 by same company, Halder Topsio. They required by a fertilizer producer who is more interested in uh, ammonia. The capacity of the uh, unit is minor, around uh, 234 kiloton annually. Uh, current uh, ammonia is uh, about to bankrupt, uh, so plans to build the second similar complex ammonia too as highly questionable. It should be noted that in the time of uh, economic crisis 2008-2009, uh, Novichokask plant of synthesis uh, products ceased methanol production based on coal as feedstock. This uh, reason from lagging like technology, uh, according to company representatives, uh, methanol costs was two times higher than the real market price. Uh, on the left, uh, you can see uh, production volume dynamics between 2005 2019. In 2019, Russia produced 4.46 million metric ton of methanol. This is around 5% of global production. The world financial crisis affected uh, the methanol production in 2009-2010. This uh, depressed domestic uh, methanol demand and export from Russia. The production output reached the same level only in 2013. Uh, top methanol producers in Russia by 2020 are Metafrax, Shokin Azot, Sibmetahim, and Tomet. The average annual capacity utilization in 2020 is nearly 94%. Uh, 
Uh, methanol produced in Russia is uh, delivered to export to domestic market and is being consumed by companies for self-use. Uh, as far as uh, domestic consumption is fully covered by production, uh, there is no need for import. Uh, self-use has a share around 18% level of produced methanol in consumption structure. In plant uh, processing holds 30% share of consumption in 2019. 70% of it is formaldehyde production. Between uh, 2005 uh, 2019, in plant use increased by 20% due to modernization processes and additional capacity launch. Uh, in the at the same time, deliveries to the, to the domestic market uh, grew up beyond 90%. Uh, the rest of methanol is exported. Uh, in Russia, methanol is uh, mainly utilized uh, as a feedstock uh, in a chemical and is uh, and as a support agent in oil and gas industry for uh, production and transportation at low temperatures. Uh, formaldehyde production represents the half of total consumption over the last year. Uh, production rise in Russia goes in line with uh, consumption growth. Uh, facility, uh, facilities with uh, lagging technology are being replaced by eco-friendly ones. This contributes to final product quality, which is demanded on market. Uh, Metafrax is one of the largest formaldehyde producers in Russia. Octane uh, increasing components as methyl tertiary butyl ether and tertiary methyl ether constitute about 26% in methanol consumption. Uh, this area tends to grow in volumes in line with formaldehyde production within last years. In 2019, 40% of uh, produced MTBE. Europe keeps being the main export destination. Uh, methanol usage in oil and uh, gas industry and acetic acid remains unchanged. Other areas on the pie chart uh, include solvent production, uh, dimethyl ether and in aerosol quality and uh, various uh, chemical products. Uh, methanol consumption pattern in Russia differs from a global one. Uh, since China is world leading uh, methanol consumer, uh, global consumption pattern mostly reflects Chinese market behavior. Uh, formaldehyde production takes the first place both in world consumption pattern and in Russia. We know that formaldehyde can be applied to obtain the rich on various higher value added products for diverse industrial fields. In case of volume uh, increase in high-tech, low-toxic derived products, Russia has an opportunity to strengthen its position on the foreign markets. Uh, Olefin Olefin's technology is actively developed in China. Uh, is actively developed in China uh, under a condition of uh, shortage in oil, China derives ethylene and propylene from methanol. This increases uh, Chinese uh, competitive uh, advantage in uh, of polymer products on the domestic and, and overseas markets. Pyrolysis, uh, catalytic cracking, and uh, propane dehydrogenation units uh, cover domestic demand in Russia on ethylene and propylene. Uh, there is a couple of projects on MTO with uh, blue perspectives. Uh, gas industry, uh, methanol consumption in Russia remains unchanged. Uh, consumption growth is highly uh, correlated with uh, natural gas production and transportation uh, advancing. The countries are perceived as promising well, it is applied as additive to gasoline, a substitute for gasoline or diesel, as a feedstock to increase the number in derived product synthesis such as MTBE, TAME, monomethyl aniline. In Russia, the methanol usage as fuel is limited by approved additives MTBE and TAME. 
For instance, uh, dimethyl ether in Russia is synthesized in small quantities at small scaled units. This is mostly utilized in aerosol production. MTB TME production volume rises gradually as monomethyl aniline was banned in Russia in 2016 as gasoline additive. Acetic acid uh, production uh, meets domestic demand. Also, there is room for export shipments. Market is stable. In here, uh, you can see uh, dynamics of Russia exports. Uh, as of uh, 2019, the top uh, exporters are Shokin, Azot, Metafrax, Sigmetahim, and Tomet. Uh, export volumes grew up by 66%. 1.3 to 2.1 million ton annually between uh, 2015 and uh, 2019. Uh, Metafrax, uh, Shokin Azot, and Tomet export shipments almost doubled. I should say that uh, Metafrax partially uh, switched volumes from domestic market to export. Shokin Azot benefited from additional unit launch. The RAS uh, Tomet did both uh, increased production volumes and cut in just uh, Chinese market is looked for Russian export due to distant location and high railway costs. Methanol is exported mostly to European countries. Uh, Finland is uh, the main uh, transit point for the export. Uh, development of ability is uh, correlated with the involvement of methanol to higher value added products and the equipping of Russian seaports. In addition to that, a new seaports infrastructure buildings uh, will be uh, the most uh, will be the most uh, ideal state. There are some unknowns projects uh, on these plans to fulfill by 2024. As of today, uh, they are still at design phase. Timing of these projects will be evaluated in the forecast section. Uh, uh, domestic uh, methanol prices are linked to European uh, contract prices and the ruble exchange rate against major world currencies. Changes uh, in the price of natural gas or fluctuations in the demand on methanol from domestic consumers have little effect uh, on the price. In the European and Asian markets, the situation is exactly the opposite. Since uh, production costs, consumer demand, the launch of new industries and in general uh, changes in export-import flows have a direct impact on the price trends. As you can see on the graph, uh, China still sets uh, consumption there is too high. Changes in oil prices also affect uh, the methanol prices dynamics. Since the high cost of oil in comparison to natural gas uh, drives fuel switch from oil products to methanol and its uh, derivatives. Uh, the chart uh, presents three development scenarios of methanol facilities in Russia by 2025. The optimistic option one considers the implementation of all announced modernization plans for existing facilities, project, uh, projects under construction, and projects currently in design phase. According to this forecast, the total methanol production capacity in Russia will reach 11.6 million metric ton, uh, having more than doubled in comparison with 2020. By a realistic scenario, the declared modernization of, of existing plants, plants is not counted. Uh, the startups of uh, new capacities at Shokin Azot, uh, Nizhnikamsk, Neftihim, Gas Synthes, and the Nakhodka Mineral Fed are considered. The plans for commissioning uh, ESN and Himprom Volgograd projects have been postponed by 2025. Under this scenario, uh, methanol production capacities by 2025 in Russia will also double as well, uh, comparing to 2020. 
the pessimistic scenario also does not does not take into account the modernization uh, projects uh, at the planning stage are postponed for 2025 only the m uh, 500 unit that shocking azot is accounted here which is currently under construction according to a pessimistic forecast uh, methanol capacities in russia will grow by 10 percent at 20 and the uh, the volume of exports uh, subject of to a recovery in global demand uh, may increase by 2023 up to 2.6 ton analysis of uh, retrospective global methanol prices shows uh, after a fall the market is able to recover quickly uh, given the dominant role of asia asia specifically china methanol prices uh, will remain low until consumption is uh, restored in china according to annex the largest producer of uh, methanol in the world the results of uh, q1 2020 uh, global demand for methanol uh, decreased by seven percent compared to q4 2019 year at the same time according to the national bureau of uh, statistics of china the profit of the industry of raw materials and chemical products in q1 2020 decreased by 59 percent compared to, to the corresponding period last year. Amid ongoing oil and coronavirus crisis, no sense quick recovery of the world market. Uh, demand for methanol products continues to be weak, uh, and uh, quarantine measures do not help restore fuel consumption to pre-crisis levels. Due to the uncertain economic uh, situation, the companies around the world uh, suspend the construction of new facilities, uh, reduce uh, the load of existing methanol plants, regulate the number of uh, personnel involved in order to comply uh, with social distance conditions and uh, reduce current expenses. According to market participants, uh, in April, some Russian producers uh, reduced capacity utilization from 15 to 30 percent. This uh, reason from obvious decline in demand of methanol itself and its uh, product, products. I assume that this operation pattern will continue till any signs of uh, global recovery appear. I hope that the situation in the world will improve soon. Take care of yourselves and stay healthy. Uh, thank you for the attention. Okay, thank you, Anna. So your presentation was that much impressive that even connection could not resist it. Yeah. Okay, so now it's time to warm up your fingers, and we have some poll questions for you. So, in your opinion, what should Russian producers focus their efforts on? Please push your answers here. I will give you some kind of half of a minute. So, should it be developing new areas of methanol consumption or deep formaldehyde processing? Okay, 10 more seconds. Okay, so the results are here. So most of you suppose that we need uh, to develop new areas of methanol consumption. Probably we're in, in Russia, we should think about like fuel, right? Or something like that. Okay, so thank you for your response. And now, uh, welcome on our virtual stage, my colleague, Nadezhda Selivanova. She will talk about another large uh, petrochemical market in Russia as basic polymer market. Nadezhda, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dina. Can you Good luck. hear me? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, good morning, colleagues. My name is Nadezhda. I am a polymer market expert in Refinitiv, and now 
uh, <clears throat> I will tell you about Russian basic polymer market. Uh, by basic polymers, I mean polyethylene and polypropylene. So firstly, let's take a short look on uh, Russian polymer market uh, in total. As you can see on the left graph, uh, Russian polymer industry produces uh, different uh, uh, plastics, a wide uh, range of them, uh, not only polyethylene and polypropylene, but also PVC, polystyrene, PET, uh, polycarbonate, also polyamides, uh, synthetic rubbers, and uh, some other polymer uh, grades. But we can't talk about the Russian polymer market without mentioning CIS countries market, I mean USSR ex-USSR countries. Uh, while Russia produces uh, a wide range of uh, polymers, uh, uh, CIS countries mostly have um, basic polymers and uh, some PVC and uh, PET units. That uh, CIS countries, they are partners for uh, Russian market, but in some cases, uh, sometimes they are competitors for Russian polymer producers. Uh, I will show some example a little bit later. And now, now let's get closer to polyethylene and polypropylene Russian industry. So, uh, in Russia, three types of polyethylene produced uh, low density polyethylene high density polyethylene linear low density polyethylene i will call it linear polyethylene it's just shorter and uh, two types of uh, polypropylene homopolymers and copolymers of propylene so what i must say about uh, low density polyethylene uh, low density polyethylene is uh, not so large tonnage as uh, polypropylene and uh, HDP and linear polyethylene and uh, most of its uh, capacities were construction in Soviet period. Uh, the, uh, there is old technologies, old polymer, polymer grades and uh, in this my presentation I want to talk more about this product, what you must know about uh, Russian LDP. Yes, in Russia we have LDP units, that's all. Uh, so, uh, HDP and linear polyethylene are the next generation products. And uh, as you can see in the table and on the graph, most of uh, capacity was were constructed uh, in post-Soviet period uh, with the new technologies and uh, gi give us a competitive on a global market product. Uh, practically the same situation is with the uh, polypropylene. As you can see on the graph uh, and in the table, there is a great development in this product. And uh, most of practically all capacities uh, were, were constructed in post-Soviet period with uh, new technologies. And now let's uh, take a closer look to these three markets and uh, what do we see here? Uh, both polyethylene markets, uh, HDP and uh, linear polyethylene, are import dependent. Uh, more or less, uh, LDP uh, depends uh, on import more, and uh, HDP a little bit less, but there is this dependence. Uh, the different situation is with the polypropylene market. Uh, polypropylene market is net exporter, uh, but uh, it became so uh, not uh, very long ago, just recently, about uh, three or two years, with the construction and uh, launching new plants, uh, new units. Uh, the uh, last year, in 2019, in April, Zapsib Niftihim, new Sibur unit, uh, uh, 500 uh, polypropylene kilotons polypropylene per year uh, was launched, and uh, you can see on the graph uh, it gave us uh, more additional uh, polypropylene for export and uh, for import substitution in Russian market. Uh, 
that ship Nifty Him launched its polyethylene uh, uh, polyethylene uh, units uh, in uh, November. So now uh, we can see it for the difference for 2019, uh, this additional volumes of product. But uh, we will see it uh, this year, 2020, and uh, we are waiting for ex import substitution and uh, growth of export. So uh, let's take a look uh, on uh, export and import flows. Uh, Russia has a foreign trade of polymers with neighbor countries, um, with C uh, CIS countries, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and some neighboring uh, countries uh, from Europe and Asia. Uh, you may remember I told that uh, CIS countries, producers, are the competitors for Russian ones. So what I mean? On the upper di diagram, you see that uh, uh, product HDP uh, from uh, CIS, uh, mostly from Uz Uzbekistan, uh, traded on Russian market uh, even lower than our Russian domestic products. Uh, most of uh, high density polyethylene is imported to Russia from Uzbekistan, as you can see. Uh, the different situation is with the uh, linear polyethylene. Most of uh, this uh, material comes from Finland and some other European countries. And uh, this uh, plastic is uh, more expensive than uh, Russian analogs. But uh, because of lack of this uh, product uh, in the Russian market, uh, consumers uh, have to pay more for this product. And, uh, for the polypropylene, we have uh, practically the same situation. As you can see, uh, CIS product uh, is traded lower, even lower than uh, Russian plastic. And uh, uh, imported uh, copolymer from Euro European countries and Korea is uh, more expensive than our domestic analogs, but uh, because of a little deficit of, the, of it, uh, uh, consumers have to pay more. Um, but uh, I must say that uh, with, uh, th with launching of uh, Zapsib Niftihim, uh, this year situation, especially with polyethylene, will change. Uh, export, I think, will increase, import will decrease, and uh, will be import substitution. Uh, okay, Zapsib Niftihim was successfully launched uh, last, year, last year, but uh, what's the next? Uh, in Russia, uh, we have uh, some uh, development uh, projects of uh, polymers, basic polymers, and uh, I divided them in two groups. Uh, one group uh, that uh, most uh, realistic project that uh, will be implemented by 2024. Uh, there are two projects. Nizhnikams Niftihim with the, the new pyrolysis first line and uh, Irkutsk Petrochemical Company. And the next um, group, next list of uh, projects, uh, they are uh, some projects and uh, most of them are in the design phase uh, of uh, phase of making decision uh, maybe some of uh, them i hope will be implemented uh, some of them may be cancelled delayed may change uh, configuration uh, we will see it later but uh, in the very optimistic scenario if all of this uh, project will be realized, uh, Russian polyethylene production will uh, increase more than four times and more than twice will increase polypropylene production. And uh, 
producers may uh, think where will they send the additional product uh, because uh, production growth is the one side of a medal and the other side other side is consumption uh, Russian consumption grows not too f uh, fast uh, as a uh, production and uh, most of uh, Russian in Russia polyethylene and polypropylene in is consumed in uh, making films, packaging, uh, producing consumer goods, uh, tubes, uh, constructing materials, uh, and uh, some other sectors. You know, with all this uh, COVID situation, uh, Russian gross domestic product uh, is expected to decline about uh, four to six percent, and uh, global product will decrease to about three percent. And uh, with it, uh, total consumption of uh, plastics in Russia will decrease. Uh, I think it will. It can be about uh, five percent. And uh, exception may be in for polypropylene in non-woven materials that uh, uh, materials are used to make medicine masks and uh, protective uh, medical clothes and uh, some films uh, for the same purposes uh, for throwaway gloves uh, for protective films uh, also growth is uh, possible in the sector of composite materials to make uh, medical equipment but uh, in total our consumption will decrease uh, from 2021 uh, the recovery growth uh, is expected different uh, experts uh, gave us uh, different estimation but uh, the growth is expected uh, from 2.8 4.8 in uh, in the next year and uh, 1.5 3.5 in uh, 2022 uh, with uh, this growth uh, economical growth and uh, russian uh, domestic uh, consumption of plastics will grow too uh, and i hope it will grow faster than gross domestic products because in previous year it was so russian polymer uh, industry grows faster than domestic product. So what I must say with uh, all this um, COVID situation, uh, consumption, consumption structure of polymers may change. I think uh, some countries may revise the policy about uh, throwaway and uh, possible things and goods maybe they will be uh, will not forbid them but uh, pay more and more uh, attention to utilization of plastics uh, this uh, problem this utilization is the greatest uh, issue for all uh, polymer industry and uh, uh, it it will become it will become uh, the most important problem i think utilization uh, but i think uh, i hope that the world will pass through this uh, situation successfully and uh, became stronger and wiser and uh, on this optimistic point i finish thank you for your attention thank you Nadezhda, for such a cup comprehensive view on the polymer market and for such optimism <laughs> for our next slide. Okay, guys, so it's time to you to speak. Yeah, we have one more poll question for you. Uh, what new areas, according to your opinion of consumption, should Russia pro Russian producers develop once the crisis is over and production volumes are back to the normal figures? Okay, again, 30 seconds for you to reply. Please check all of the options we have here. We have a multiple number of them.
Okay. Hope everyone is done. And the results. Oh, that's interesting to see that most of the audience uh, hope to see others in this question. Okay, I kindly ask you to write your others option in our Q&A section so we can understand your view. Thank you, everyone. And now we have our guest speaker for today, Eugenia Deschluk, um, equity analyst responsible for Russian oil and gas and petrochemical sectors with Gazprom Bank. Uh, Eugenia will mention uh, some kind of external view on Russian petrochemical producers. Eugenia, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you, Azina. So I'll just... Uh give you some comments uh, about the situation with the Russian uh, petrochemical producers. I hope they, they will be useful. So to start, uh, uh, I will uh, illustrate it by uh, the case, uh, presenting the case of Sibur. Uh, Sibur is a Russia-based uh, largest petrochemical producer in Eastern Europe. So to start, uh, I must say that uh, we've seen uh, prices, uh, sales prices uh, of seaboard from Eastern and petrochemicals products uh, under pressure since uh, last year. So uh, coronavirus actually affected them, but uh, the decline uh, began a year ago. In 2019, on the, uh, on the top side of this chart, you can see that uh, the prices were already down, and midstream, pro, which is uh, LPG and NAFTA, uh, the decline was uh, uh, almost 20%, which is much higher than the oil price, although typically uh, LPG correlates highly with the oil price. And this was driven by increased competition from uh, LPG uh, volumes coming from the United States. Uh, there was an oversupply in the market. And uh, because the um, U.S. was uh, increasing oil production and uh, respectively the byproducts such as APG and NGLs, um, yeah, from uh, which LPG is manufactured. So uh, there was pressure on the uh, supply side, high volumes. Uh, we also saw declines in uh, plastics, uh, for instance, on glycols. Uh, it was driven by... Uh, capacity expansions in the uh, United States and China. Uh, synthetic rubbers were under pressure, uh, especially in the specialty rubber uh, business, and polymers were also down. Uh, in the first quarter of this year, uh, this uh, the, uh, the prices went uh, down further, reflecting the coronavirus effect. Uh, so we, we see that uh, the heat was uh, mainly in the plastics uh, segment, which is uh, marked on the chart as uh, light blue. Uh, because of the slowdown of economic activity, there was a drop in demand uh, for uh, petrochemical products used in construction, uh, used to manufacture uh, long um, use uh, consumer goods. Uh, elastomers were also under pressure as uh, uh, automotive manufacturers uh, stopped their production. And uh, there was also a low demand for tires because people didn't drive. And uh, polymers were also under pressure. So, uh, I mean, basically we saw the decline across all the product segments uh, last year and the first quarter of this year. Um, but there are some good news for some of the products. Although, as I mentioned, that uh, construction, automotive, transportation, fuel, uh, and utilities businesses were under pressure, resulting in reduced uh, uh, prices for, uh, for PVC, expendable polystyrene, acrylates, elastomers, glycols, uh, LPG, MTB, fuel additives, uh, a wide selection of products. There are some good news about, um, for basic polymers and uh, for selected uh, plastics products. Uh, there was a robust demand uh, for polymers used in packaging, cleaning products, uh, medicines, and uh, household products, uh, driven uh, by the uh, coronavirus situation. 
and there was also a higher demand for medical grade polymers used, used in healthcare. This uh, suggests that this um, product segments uh, will be uh, in strong demand this year, I assume. So, so um, it's good to be uh, a diversified uh, petrochemical producer. We'll come back to that. So what, what, what to expect next? Um, uh, if you look at the midstream segment, um, uh, there are two uh, important factors to consider. First of all, we expect the recovery of oil prices. And this should drive uh, prices for midstream products, LPG and NAFTA up, because they, as I mentioned, they highly correlate with oil. Also, the new OPEC++ plus plus agreement, uh, which uh, limits global oil production, should result in lower output of byproducts, uh, the feedstock for midstream segments, such as APG and natural gas liquids. And as a result, we should see lower volumes uh, of production for midstream. Uh, it's good for prices for midstream products, but it's not as good as for, uh, it's not good for petrochemical segment, which uses uh, mystery pro products as feedstock. It means that uh, there will be um, decreased availability of, the, of this uh, feedstock. In Russia, uh, the measures to support uh, midstream segment was um, uh, the government has uh, approved a 40% discount for LPG railway transportation tariff. Uh, it, it is a very big contribution to profitability because the, um, the uh, transportation cost for liquids is very high in Russia. Uh, it costs roughly between $150 per ton to $250 per ton to transport LPG from West Siberia to Europe. Uh, and uh, in May, we saw a negative net index for LPG. So this uh, measure to reduce the transportation tariff comes very um, Mm, handy <laughs> for, for producers, uh, uh, for LPG producers such as Sibur and Novatec. And also, uh, the, the, the tax system uh, suggests zero export use uh, for LPG at, uh, at price levels to roughly 500, which is uh, uh, the current price. Uh, and so, um, sorry. And so we expect, um, uh, okay, I lost my chart. Hold on. Mm. And so we expect uh, that this measure to support LPG producers will be uh, val very valuable. In return, uh, the Russian LPG producers uh, have committed to um, certain export volumes uh, for the next three years. In petrochemicals, we expect uh, to uh, also two trends. The first of all uh, is gradual recovery of demand. And uh, this, is, uh, this means that the price spreads in petrochemicals will remain under pressure for some time, but uh, eventually they should uh, increase in line with the demand. And we also expect uh, flattening of the global cost curve for polymers. And uh, uh, this means increased competition from NAFTA-based characters. Uh, the, in, in terms of uh, domestic support uh, in Russia, the government uh, uh, this year approved a tax subsidy for new petrochemical projects, feeding on LPG and ethane. It comes in the form of negative excise tax of LPG and ethane, uh, and uh, it will be applied to new projects. So beneficiary, uh, the main beneficiary of this will be Sibur, which um, targets to build a new uh, ethane-based, uh, not, not only ethane, but also ethane and LPG-based cracker in the farm. Price. Uh, and it's going to be bigger than the subsidy which we mentioned already. Uh, so, Sibur uh, should be one of the main beneficiaries of the tax uh, uh, breaks. And what um, can support uh, profitability of petrochemical producer in such a, in such an environment? Uh, let's look at example of Sibur. Uh, Sibur has sustained a relatively stable profitability. And as you can see on the top chart, uh, uh, the gray bars represent aggregate EBITDA margin of the company. 
for the, for the last several years, you can see that Sibur maintain uh, uh, above average profitability of uh, over 30%, even in the first quarter 2020, which is very rare for, uh, for uh, uh, traditional petrochemical producers. And and this, uh, this uh, they managed to do it uh, even despite the variation of margins of certain segments. You can see, for instance, in the light blue uh, bars, uh, which represent the margin of plastics, uh, elastomers, and the intermediate segment, that uh, there was a ma major deterioration of profitability, and the EBITDA margin uh, declined to 8% uh, in the first quarter, which single-digit uh, EBITDA margins are very rare for uh, even for traditional legacy petrochemicals. So what helped the uh, Sibur to maintain a uh, stable EBITDA margin despite deterioration of uh, profitability of certain products is a uh, balanced business model and diversified, uh, diversified product portfolio. Sibur, uh, um, uh, for Sibur, uh, midstream uh, accounts for roughly 40% of the revenue currently. So, uh, and this petrochemical side is very diversified. It allows to sustain an aggregate uh, very stable margin, and even uh, when there is volatility in certain products. Also, um, uh, I must mention that uh, Sibur procures its stock locking the margins to mainstream products. This means that when the um, prices for feedstock fluctuate, uh, the EBITDA margin remains the same. So basically, in the long-term uh, contracts for feedstock, they basically fix uh, the EBITDA, uh, the margin. This helps support profitability as well. And on the bottom of the slide, you can see that uh, as a result of this uh, uh, diversified and balanced business model, the company's uh, financial indicators have not declined as much as uh, as we saw, like in oil and gas or uh, in other petrochem producers. Uh, in the first quarter, uh, Simbol Subida margin was down on by only like 16% uh, versus like we saw like 50% declines for, for commodity producers. Another important factor is for. Uh, that supports profitability of petrochemical producers is uh, such as Sibur is adding uh, high margin projects to the portfolio. Uh, we mentioned, uh, we already talked about um, the fact that the company launched the Subsip. It's a world class cracker in industry media, feeding on LPG produced by Sibur. It was launched last year and uh, uh, it hasn't shown yet on the results of Sibur in the first quarter, but it's going to be contributing to the company's financials this year, for sure. And uh, we can see uh, uh, there are a lot of numbers, but uh, the important numbers of the shares are, are highlighted by the um, frame. The, we can see that uh, under 30 to 60 oil price scenario, which uh, I, I think is pretty uh, basic uh, expectation, uh, the, uh, uh, the contribution of this project uh, to be done free cash flow of Cebu is roughly $1 billion. And the BIDA margin uh, comes uh, in the range of uh, 45 to 55%. So this is a high margin business uh, because, as we mentioned on the slide before, typical EBITDA margin um, for petrochemicals uh, uh, like in plastics, it, it, it comes in the range between. 10 to 25 percent, the, the light blue bar on the on the top chart. So this uh, enhancing the product, uh, the portfolio of assets, adding new projects with high profitability, they uh, really help the company sustain these tough times. And also um, the volumes which Zapsip con consumes, uh, the LPG volumes, they will not be coming out of the market. And uh, so, uh, as a result of some seed, uh, basically, Simbor will have uh, fewer exposure to mainstream segment, which is being very volatile and driven by commodity prices. So, uh, this is um, the end of my comments. Uh, I'll be happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, Eugenia. 
uh, for enlightening to the current situation on the uh, chemical producers market. And uh, I kindly remind you to refer to our Q&A section so you can post the questions there. We will answer them either in the chat or after the webinar together with emailed webinar materials. So we are good in timing, and I would like to welcome my colleague from ISIS, Nigel. Can you hear me? Are you here with us? I can, Dina. I can, Dina. Good I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you very yeah, much yeah, to the yeah. speaker. Good. Good. Thank you, Dina, and thank you very much to the speakers so far this morning. Some fascinating comments there on the methanol polymers and uh, and the general chemicals market in, in Russia and beyond. Um, some very interesting points coming through and as regards recycling, perhaps, you know, the major projects that, uh, that can certainly be built in Russia to serve global markets. And of course, what's going to happen to those global markets? I think the ICIS portion of this of this webinar is to really focus on, <clears throat> excuse me, is to really focus on those international markets and what this uh, terrible pandemic uh, means in terms of the development of demand for petrochemicals, for polymers particularly, over the next uh, uh, quarters and certainly the next few years. And we've seen the world change quite radically in terms of chemicals and uh, petrochemicals demand in the past few months. <clears throat> and of course, it all depends as to how we actually come out of this crisis and are able to deal with the, with the aftermath. Are we moving to some sort of new normal, which my colleague John Richardson will talk about in a few, few minutes, um, or uh, will things return to uh, perhaps where they were before? I think that latter statement is probably untrue. Um, you know, what's ha what does happen to the future demand for petrochemicals? We're in a situation now where most chemical plants are running uh, below capacity, well below capacity. Uh, capacity utilization has fallen quite dramatically. But on the other hand, uh, chemicals are seen as an essential industry in most countries and therefore being able to continue operating. And of course, it's all down to demand. It's demand in the general economy, demand in the manufacturing economy. What's that demand going to look like in future? I think what I'll do is I'll hand over now directly to my colleague, um, John Richardson, and then he can talk us through these slides that he has on uh, looking at uh, getting used to the coronavirus and the new normal that that coronavirus is creating for the petrochemical industry. John, over to you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Nigel. Um, as Nigel said, it's a new normal. Um, and one thing I spent a lot of time doing a few weeks ago was trying to work out a timetable for recovery when we could get out of this crisis. So if you can see from this first slide here, there's a worst case outcome and a best case outcome. And I won't read through all the, all the points for you, but essentially we don't know whether we're gonna get a, um, a vaccine that will, will cure the disease or stop the disease. And we haven't got a, a vaccine for MERS or SARS. We don't know if we'll build up the antibodies necessary to have herd immunity. Well, a lot of countries now, of course, are coming out of, of, of coronavirus. It's sort of the, the lockdowns, you know, Japan and parts of Europe, Southeast Asia. But there's a risk of a, of a second wave of the virus. Um, and trying to time when we get out of this virus is it, very difficult to say. The politics is, is very worrying. Uh, the potential for US-China trade war, the blame game, who's to blame for this crisis, which is kind of distracting from dealing with it. But um, obviously po politics building into the November presidential election, what's going to happen there, will the election be cancelled, all this negative stuff versus the, the best case where things go smoothly. We get a virus, we get herd immunity, there's no major political unrest. Um, it's completely up in the air. And to be honest, as I said, I, I was looking at this a few weeks ago and decided at the end, nobody, but nobody can say when we're going to come out of this crisis. So basically for the chemical industry, it means getting on with the situation as it is. Dealing with coronavirus is a kind of, we don't know when it's going to be over, so let's get on with dealing with the problems and try to manage the business. That's the key thing. How do we manage chemical companies? And one thing that's clear to me is forecasting is impossible using the normal metrics. We cannot forecast prices. I'm going to talk uh, in a second about oil prices, but let's just move downstream one step to naphtha. Here I'm looking at Asian CFR Japan naphtha prices. 
um, and you see the bottom is a pattern of multiples. Uh, what you do is you multiply the the Brent price between um, just below seven, just slightly above ten historically. So the price per barrel to get the price per ton, you multiply just below seven, slightly above ten historically. And you see there's a very very clear pattern here over the last uh, 19 years that you get a a nation shutdown season for crackers where the demand for that for falls. You get a peak production season in China from about August, September onwards when the demand for NAPTA goes up. You've got various peak demand seasons in China uh, and around Asia for gasoline, blending NAPTA into gasoline. We just don't know what's going to happen. Will we end up with tight NAPTA and therefore higher multiples than usual over Brent because of all the refinery cutbacks I'm going to talk about later on? Or will we have an oversupply of NAPTA because the refineries are running to make the essential diesel, but they've got less demand for naphtha uh, for blending into gasoline, and that's surplus for petrochemicals. We just don't know. Um, and then coming on to oil prices as well, um, have we seen the recovery in oil prices over the last few weeks? That's been linked with the relief of the feeling that we're getting towards a recovery from coronavirus as well, we're over the worst of the situation. And that's led to a rebound in equity markets. But fundamentally, the issue is when will demand come back to where it was before for gasoline and kerosene, jet fuel? We know jet fuel is not going to come back for a long, long time, if ever, because of the collapse of, of flying, uh, business travel, you know, personal travel is completely collapsed. In terms of gasoline demand, that might start coming gra gradually. But the risk is the financial markets and the equity markets, the, the, the speculators in oil have pushed oil up quite quite a lot the last few weeks. And it's a kind of false dawn um, that we could easily see a collapse of oil prices again. Uh, this, is, this is the fundamental problem. And I'm very bearish on crude, actually, going forward. I see around 30 being the price for the rest of this year. I can't see it going much higher than that. Um, just because of the loss of demand, simple as that. And the other thing we have to be really careful about now is the narrative or the story coming out of China. The narrative, the story is that China is recovering uh, from the economic, from the, the, the coronavirus crisis. Demand is coming back very strongly. Now, We've always got to be skeptical about Chinese official government numbers. They produce their GDP growth numbers just two weeks at the end of each quarter. Those numbers are never revised. Um, last year, it didn't matter because the economy was rising. It was all going up. It didn't matter. So everybody knew that you took 10% off the official numbers to get towards the real state of the economy. But now we have this disconnect we have this huge rise in, in production. So the refineries have come back. The petrochemical plants are back, producing a lot. The SMEs, the small and medium-sized enterprises, are running. But the, the information on the ground say the orders are very weak. So they've switched the machines on again. But the demand is not there, certainly not for the export orders. Because, of course, exports of Chinese manufactured goods to the West has collapsed. I think there's a chance, there's a chance that China has negative GDP growth this year. I think the government will do their very best to stop that. Um, but there's a chance it could go negative. And very significantly, the National People's Congress meeting last Friday, they decided not to set an annual GDP growth target. And that's the first time in 30 years they've done that. So that's pointed towards the problems China faces in recovering from the crisis. And looking now specifically at the some of the petrochemicals, um, here I'm looking at uh, polyethylene demand. Um, this is based on, on two scenarios here. Um, one scenario assumes we get out of this situation, the worst of this situation in six months. Um, we're out of the situation in six months and, you know, demand starts to recover. The, 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 the worst case is it takes another two years. So my best case outcome, pre-crisis forecasts are there on your left. 
in the middle bars are the best case outcomes, my best case outcomes, that we're through this in six months. The worst case, it takes another two years. As you can see, the worst case outcome involves demand of 47 million tonnes lower on a cumulative basis. That's for all the years in that forecast period, the three years, than our base case at the moment. So I think my worst case is too pessimistic. Absolutely. My best case is probably too optimistic. It's somewhere in between the two. And one of the things that's been debated a lot, an awful lot, is different types of petrochemical demand and polymers demand. Now, certainly for packaging, um, we've seen a lot of uh, panic buying in supermarkets. We've seen a big buildup of, uh, of food in people's larders, people panic buying toilet rolls and food. And that supported the packaging business. And certainly for hygiene products, uh, disinfectant, et cetera, floor cleaners, all contained in polyethylene or polypropylene bottles. So that has supported demand. And certainly in the short term, that's been a benefit. Um, question then, of course, becomes as people move out of lockdowns, will that panic buying decline? And there are signs of that happening in Europe. And this, this pie chart here from our supply and demand database shows that 30% of polypropylene um, consumption this year will go into packaging, which is good news. That's uh, you know flexible packaging, rigid package, packaging. A lot of that is for food and essential items. The bad news is the automobile industry, which is 10%. We've got um, electrical manufacturing, uh, household equipment. We've got construction, electrical equipment. So you put all those things together, and around 40% of polypropylene demand is for durable goods. This is the stuff that people are not buying uh, because of the crisis. Go through every petrochemical polymer you look at and split durable versus non-durable. I think that's crucial. And I think the durable goods, the ones, the, the chemicals upon them are going to durable goods, will be worse affected. This is the issue. And um, this is the polypropylene chart. Um, again, you see my, uh, my best case in the middle, uh, pre-crisis forecast on the right, sorry, on the left, sorry, on the left, and the far right is the worst case. Um, I feel that even with the chemicals and polymers that are being supported by packaging demand and medical uses, such as the PP non-woven going into face masks, of course, demand for that is tremendous. I think the sheer loss of economic activity means we're looking at negative demand growth for most of the petrochemicals and polymers uh, this year into 2021, possibly. Hopefully not next year, but certainly this year. And a risk of that next year as well. Um, I think we just need to get used to that idea as an industry and, and manage the business accordingly. That will mean lower operating rates for plants. It will mean closure of plants uh, where possible. Um, it might mean that we have to run plants or steam crackers at operating rates much lower than we have been used to. And that will require some technical adjustments possibly. Plants will need to keep on operating to supply essential needs. So it's food packaging and medical, whereas the recovery in automobile markets, we just cannot predict it. You know, we cannot predict that when that's going to happen. So focusing on packaging and medical needs is absolutely crucial. And one of the things I've been talking a lot about the last few weeks is micro surges in demand. It's not all disastrous. We're going to get situations where people will come out of lockdown and they will want to spend more money. They've suddenly been bored at home, sat at home in their condos, in their flats. They'll come out and spend more money. Now, this photograph is from Italy. And you can see here people are standing a long way apart because of social distancing, wearing masks. There were reports from Europe a few weeks ago of big queues of people at the furniture shops, the IKEAs in Europe, as they came out of lockdowns. Um, the question is, how dense are those queues? How far are people apart? Um, normally, this is a down season in Europe for furniture sales. So does that mean we're getting people coming out of lockdown? Demand for TDI, flexible foams, will increase as people buy more sofas, more beds, 
how much TDI is in the inventory system, how much foam, flexible foam is in the in, in the warehouses. So what chemical companies will need to do in cases like this, lots more cases, is really manage demand from the bottom up to really look at micro trends in the market, look at consumer trends. Every opportunity there is to push operating rates a little bit higher will be crucial for them. It, it's a very different mindset because petrochemical companies normally think in hundreds of thousands of tons of demand, big, big amounts of demand. So it's a different way of looking at markets. But I think essentially you've got to look for those micro surges in demand to try and repair your balance sheets. And it, I mean, the amount of complications are extraordinary. I've been doing this for 23 years and I've never, ever seen this many complications in the markets. Um, I was mentioned before about how the refineries operate, um, how they will operate in the future. We've had this huge loss of transportation fuels demand. And we've seen in Europe in particular, a lot of refineries have cut back their production. So potentially, that means a lack of naphtha for steam crackers. And F, a lack of SEC propylene for downstream propylene oxide, polypropylene production, et cetera. Uh, and here, this chart here, this table rather, from um, the IC data analytics team shows the amount of capacity under threat from loss of naphtha or loss of FCC propylene um, and loss of benzene uh, from reformers. But what's extraordinary is that so far that hasn't really seem to have affected petrochemical production. It's not created shortages of feedstock. And the reason is because demand is weak. Demand is weaker than the fall in the availability of feedstock. But this might change as we go forward. It's one of those complications we have to keep looking at. Hopefully, as refineries come back out of lockdowns, the situation will, will improve and there's no problem. There's no risk of a shortage of feedstock. Um, and then looking at, at the other end of the business, at balancing the steam cracker, how you run your steam cracker. There are things that we do want from a steam cracker. We want the ethylene to make the polyethylene because polyethylene goes into flexible packaging for food, rigid packaging for bottles, etc., is in high demand. Um, it's doing quite well. But we don't want some of the polypropylene I've talked about for the copolymers, impact copolymer into the automobile industry. And we certainly do not want the butadiene. As you can see here, the collapse of butadiene prices in Southeast Asia, much greater than the fall of that, the prices. Um, and butadiene predominantly goes into car tires and to ABS for electronics. And the problem that steam crackers have is butadiene is a gas, of course. How do you store it? What do you do with this unwanted butadiene? So you're running your plant because you want the ethylene, you want some of the propylene, you want some of the styrene, the benzene, to make the styrene because for general purpose polystyrene that's good. High impact polystyrene is not good. ABS is not good. Butadiene, the, the, the car tire factories have closed down. So when is auto demand going to come back? And that's a separate, sub separate subject. It's very complicated. We don't know. Uh, so the, the, the steam crackers are thinking, how do I store that butadiene? What do I do with it? Well, an option is to co-crack. You, you move it back through your cracker as feedstock. That creates technical problems, the coking up of, the, of the, the, the tubes in the cracker. So it's not ideal. But at some point, storage issues may affect the ability of crackers to operate. We're not seeing that yet. It's the further complication. I did say at the beginning um, that I wasn't going to talk about coming out of the crisis. So I've been a bit dishonest. I am going to talk about coming out of the crisis. We will at some point come out of this crisis. Um, and I believe, it's open to challenge. I'd love to hear different opinions. They're in a world of $30 crude for a long time. Um, I think that's uh, the situation. Something that I felt we're heading towards for a long time because of demographics, aging populations in the West, the retirement of the baby boomers. These two charts on your right here, which shows that the peak of the birth rates in, in the Western economies um, during the 70s, 80s, 
and those kids grew up, joined the workforce, and they are extremely wealthy, and now we're not having enough babies. You know, the population is aging, and the data at the bottom shows that all spending patterns relate to demographics. So that's been the, the driving force behind my view for a long time. They were heading to lower crude prices, along with a big push towards sustainability. I feel coronavirus has accelerated this whole process. I think that people will be more interested now in affordability because of the lost wealth effect. I think they've got used to clean air and clean skies. I think the sustainability agenda will, will return when we're out of this crisis. And I think there's a whole different way of looking at petrochemicals in terms of adding value to society rather than just producing big volumes of petrochemicals. The world will be very, very different. That's probably a whole separate presentation, which I'm not going to have time to, to give here. But um, I've been presenting this um, on our webinars, the ICIS webinars over the last few months. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. And I'll take any questions. Well, thank you, John. Uh, Dina, would you like to ask the audience if there are any questions? Um, should we take the questions um, verbally or do you want them uh, on the Q&A? Uh, thank you, Nigel. I believe uh, we can cover the questions later on. As of now, I don't see any in, you, in our box. Okay. Well, shall I ask a couple of questions of the presenters? Some fascinating uh, information coming through so far. Um, I'd be fascinated to, th to ask Anna really what she thinks the other section is in that demand for methanol from in, in Russia. You know, how do, how do you grow out demand for methanol um, in Russia, particularly given what's happening in China, for instance, and the demand for methanol in that part, part of the world uh, may not be so strong in, in the next few years. Okay, Anna, there? That's, that's, that's sorry to put you on the spot. I believe I... <laughs> Anna is already off. So uh, I think we can cover these questions uh, in the writing format, if you don't mind. Is it okay for you? Like, all oh, of the course. questions for our speakers, as we are really tight, uh, you know, uh, cattle <laughs> these days. Okay, okay, that's fine. So shall we just wait for questions then, Dina? Oh, I think we can give a couple of minutes for to say. Uh, okay. I'm just okay. updating my Q and A Q and A box, and nothing is rare. Uh, okay, uh, please, guys, if you have anything for now for ICS speakers, uh, we'd like to hear you, or literally read you, actually, right? <laughs> Okay, Nigel, can you tell something about yes, the current location? You're so distant, right? Um, yes, I suppose we are just, yeah, I mean, we, we have, uh, I mean, John is in Perth in Australia and I'm in London, so we, we see things. Obviously, I think the point is here that this is a global, global crisis and uh, it's affecting markets globally. And, uh, you know, John and I have talked about how Obviously, this impacts the developing world as much as uh, developing world markets as much as anything else. Um, would your speakers like to say anything about, say, about plastics recycling, whether they think that's going to be particularly important as we come out of this crisis? Is that going to have an impact on demand for polymers, for instance? Um, and I'd like to I'd like to ask uh, Evgenia about uh, about um, uh, uh, about uh, as, you know the 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 petrochemicals demand growth, how important that is for companies like Ciba, you know, um, does she see that as being under, underpinning the, the, the company in the next couple of years? Eugenia, can you hear us? Okay, I guess she's also offline. And she's by the offline. Way, we okay, well, some question. Can you see it, Nigel? I can hear. Yes. Yeah. Oh, let me see. Let me see. I can see a question now. Yeah. 
So Okay, Where Wally we, uh, from Rosneft. Yeah, <laughs> some good uh, assumption to hear the similar information in one or two months, <laughs> right? The similar estimations for the market state. What do you say, Nigel? Do you think it will be the same state or something more optimistic? Would John perhaps like to answer that question? Um. I think the only honest, only, only honest answer is we don't know. <laughs> um, as I said, I've been doing this for 23 years now, and forecasting has never been more difficult. Um, I think you have to be prepared for the worst and hope for something slightly better. Um, there's no real clear path permanently out of this crisis. There's no timetable that we can be certain of. There are so many variables. I think it's a question of accepting the situation as it is and managing your business around a smaller global economy. Oh, yeah, that, 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 that's our Pareto. We are living in Russia. Hope for the best and be ready for the worst, right? I'm Trying afraid so, yeah. First year. Yeah, it's the same everywhere, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, I hope that we will be getting better soon. Okay. So, Dina, I don't so, see, see any other questions there. Do you want to perhaps wrap things up? or uh, Can you see this question from Dmitry about the major technology licensors? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Let me just... Do the major technology licenses have technology for total conversion of crude oil into petrochemicals without the producing of fuel products? Um, would you like to answer that, John? Um, like crude to chemical, I think it's crude to chemical. It's a crude to chemicals question. The question being that they have the technologies. Is that right, Nigel? It says, do the major technology licensors have technologies for total conversion of crude oil into the petrochemicals without producing fuel products? Um, yes, um, some of them do. I think there's a Aramco Savic technology, which is uh, converting more oil into petrochemicals. Um, it's not total conversion. There's still, it's still essentially, I think it's, this is right, Nigel, isn't it? You can help me here. It's a refinery that produces more heavily focused towards petrochemicals, yeah? So the fuel the fuel slate of the refinery is smaller. Um, I think really it's been mainly Aramco, if I'm not mistaken, that's been really pushing this, I think. Um, and the whole logic has been the, the decline, the long-term decline in gasoline demand as electric vehicles rise and the idea that petrochemicals can replace some of the lost oil demand. Is that right, Nigel? Yes, I believe that's the case. Um, we also have Reliance Industries has some quite interesting technology that they want to uh, um, put into practice in uh, in uh, Jamnagar, their big refinery there, <clears throat> and convert that more into a petrochemicals refinery as opposed to a as opposed to a fuels refinery. So there's some quite interesting technologies coming through, um, and I should think um, really this crisis could accelerate that development. But then, of course, you're talking about very, very expensive um, technology at the moment. And so whether those investments will be made, that's another another question, really. One thing, by the way, Nigel, as well is, I mean, I did talk about sustainability. It's my, my theory, which could be wrong, of course. But the, the, the whole pushback against single-use plastic has declined, right? So does that mean that that's a long-term decline? Will that come back? And therefore turning oil into plastics suddenly becomes more attractive because there's not that big re the recycling push. It's a big question, yeah? Because yes, this is the whole yeah. idea that petrochemicals and plastics will grow better over the long term than, than gasoline demand. That's the idea, isn't it? This is the whole push for the technology. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's central to what we've been talking about, which is... Um, 
you know, petrochemicals demand is growing faster than or is expected to grow faster than demand for fuels. And so, therefore, investment in petrochemicals, whether that's plastics or other uh, or intermediates, is is probably necessary in in a growing in a growing world where there is demand for for those products, um, as opposed to demand necessary for fuels. Um, good. I can't see any more questions on the inbox, Dina. Shall I hand things over to you? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, so, if we receive any questions later on, so our analysts will answer them uh, later, and uh, all of the materials will be sent to you by the end of uh, this week, I suppose. Uh, one thing I would like you to do before you're off, please fill our survey in order to improve ourselves for the later webinars. Uh, please stay online with us uh, for our any other webinars that we have uh, in the following months. And uh, wish you to be safe, uh, home or office, depending on your country situation. Uh, and uh, hope for the best to be at optimistic note. And uh, see you later at our webinars or probably physical conference that we will have after the situation is better. So thank you for being with us today. Uh, I'm Dina. Thank you. And uh, goodbye. Enjoy the rest of your day.